the muddy season has significantly decreased the pace of offensive operations in Ukraine in the second half of November. This period has arguably been the least active period of ground assaults by either side since the start of the war. As a result, neither side achieved any meaningful progress. We're back to the stalemate, as both Ukraine and Russia are probably waiting for snow and ice season to get back on the offensive. But as usual, there have been many updates in connection with the illegal and unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine, which we're going to share with you in this video. And in the meantime, there will be various offensives conducted in all weathers at all times, cyber attacks. While they have military applications, for us the main problem is that they can be used to steal key data like credit card information or passwords, and from there, who knows what you can lose before you even know it. There are countless ways to fall prey to these attacks, and simply being connected to the internet can be enough to put you at risk. So as well as having good password practices and avoiding strange links or emails, you should shield yourself more completely with the sponsor of this video, NordVPN, at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. They encrypt your data so that if it's intercepted, it won't be of much use to thieves, extremely useful to have if you use public internet, and it stops your ISP gathering and selling your data too. And now, with their threat protection system, you get defenses against malware and viruses built in. There are loads more features to NordVPN, so check it out and get an exclusive deal at nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals for 4 months free with a 2 year plan, and a risk free 30 day money back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash kingsandgenerals. Let's quickly go through the largely unchanged battlefield in Ukraine. The situation on the Kherson front has been relatively uneventful in this period. The information space related to this front was dominated by the news of the redeployment of Ukrainian and Russian troops to other fronts. According to the head of the Luhansk Oblast, Serhii Haidai, Russian airborne units are being redeployed to Luhansk Oblast, while Russian telegram channels stated that the bulk of Ukrainian forces on the right bank of the Dnipro are being transferred mostly to Donbass and Zaporizhia. Ukraine continued its tactic of precision strikes on Russian troop concentrations, supply lines, and military infrastructure, which it had earlier successfully used on the right bank of the Dnipro, this time on the left bank. For now, the Ukrainian advance on the left bank of the Dnipro seems unlikely due to the high expected cost of such an offensive. Earlier, we reported about a rumored deployment of Ukrainian troops on the Kinburn Spit, which was acknowledged by the spokesperson of the Ukrainian Southern Defense Forces, Natalia Hermenyuk, on November 21st. She confirmed that Ukrainian forces are conducting military operations in the area, but provided no further information. Taking the Kinburn Spit under control would mean the liberation of the last occupied portion of the Mykolaiv Oblast, securing the entrance to the rivers Dnipro and Southern Bug, and creating a bridgehead on the left bank of the Dnipro. On the North Luhansk front, Ukraine continued its attempts to take Svatova, P-66 and P-07 under its control, but they are facing dogged resistance from the Russian forces in the area, which have been bolstered by the mobilized soldiers. On November 16th, the 95th Air Assault Brigade made a small advance from Makivka toward Ploschanka. Heavy battles took place for control of Novoselivska which was reportedly recaptured by the Russian 144th Guards Motor Rifle Division, before the 92nd Mechanized Brigade pushed them back and regained control over the town. Towards the end of the month, heavy battles were reported in the southern section of this front, around Spina, as several pro-Russian accounts claimed restoration of control over this village. But this was refuted by the Wagner sponsor, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who stated that the village is still under Ukrainian control as of November 29th. Throughout this period, battles continued on the Svatova Kremina front line, but no other notable changes occurred on the map. The stalemate continued on the Zaporizhian front. As had been the case for several months, the most notable development in this area was the deployment of additional Ukrainian and Russian units to this area. After so many months of similar information being reported, it just feels inevitable that major offensive operations are going to start at some point on this front. The most interesting development from Zaporizhia in this period concerned the Zaporizhia power plant, which was heavily shelled on November 20th and 21st. As usual, both sides blamed each other, while the International Atomic Energy Agency once again called for creation of a protection zone around the power plant. 
This essentially means demilitarization of the power plant and removal of Russian forces from there. Two days later, IAEA chief Grossi met with the director of the Russian Atomic Agency, Rosatom. Whether this meeting had something to do with the claim of the director of the Ukrainian Atomic Agency, Anegatom, Petro Kotin, that there are signs that the Russians were planning to leave the power plant is unclear. But according to Kotin, one gets the impression they are packing their bags and stealing everything they can. We don't have any information to back this interesting claim, but it has already caused some degree of unease among the Russian pro-war segment. We will see in the near future if there is any truth to this claim. The situation on the Donbass front, from Solodar in the north to Mariinka in the south, became more difficult for Ukraine. Russia continued to put immense pressure on Ukrainian units in this area, arguably aiming to break through these heavily fortified areas in order to take the whole of the Donetsk Oblast under its control. For the umpteenth time, the Russians claimed to take a Pitna under control. The difference is that this time it's being confirmed by independent sources on November 18th. Wagner mercenaries and the Sparta battalion of the DPR have both been attributed with occupying this town. Russian units have also made progress inside Bakhmut, Pervomyska, Nevelska and Marienka. But the biggest setback of Ukraine on this front reportedly took place on November 23rd, when Wagner units broke through their defensive lines around Andrivka, occupying Zelenopilia and Ozaryanivka, and making gains towards Kojimivka and Andrivka. Despite claims of several Russian military bloggers, it is unlikely that Russia has advanced to Chasivyar to cut one of the supply lines to Bakhmut. Moreover, some Ukrainian sources claim that the Ukrainian army counterattacked on November 30th and pushed back the Russian army and Wagner units from Apitna, from the southern outskirts of Bakhmut, and gained a foothold in Ivanhred. At the time of writing this script, the situation in the Bakhmut section of the Donbass front is covered by the fog of war and we'll have a clearer picture in the early days of December. Putin will likely continue pushing for more lands to be taken in Donbass, and he will hope that further mobilization efforts will help to achieve this goal, along with protecting and possibly developing Russian gains on other fronts. As we reported earlier, despite declaring the end of the mobilization, the Russian army is still conducting mobilization-related measures. People are still receiving mobilization summons, and some of them require recipients to arrive at conscription stations in January 2023. Russian military bloggers have started predicting a general mobilization for the upcoming year, almost simultaneously. Different war-related figures, such as Vladimir Orlov, the head of the Vech Public Union, which has been very active in volunteer mobilization for the aid of the Russian army since the start of the war, called for a general mobilization, saying that Russia needs two million soldiers to reach its goals. Furthermore, the mobilization of inmates from Russian prisons continued as well. According to the Russian State Penitentiary Service, in September and October 2022, the number of inmates in Russian prisons decreased by 23,000 people. Such a drastic drop in the prison population is at least partially due to the continued conscription of inmates. The Daily Beast report of November 29th claims that Wagner is now also recruiting inmates from the Central African Republic, where the mercenary group has a base. The criticism of the conduct of mobilization and the use of mobilized troops continues in Russia. Mobilized units are poorly trained and equipped, they are taking heavy losses, and according to several reports, they are being thrown into the battlefield on their own without proper instruction. For instance, on November 24th, a video was recorded by the mobilized unit from Serpikovo, in which they claimed they were being sent to the front line in Lahansko Blast without any training, being abandoned by their commanders during the battle, and being forced to retreat through a forest under the bombardment of Ukrainian artillery. The Russian pro-war segment has been active throughout the war in purchasing different supplies for Russian soldiers, particularly for the mobilized, who don't get much equipment at all. The decision of the Russian Ministry of Defense to increase customs control over dual-use goods like clothing, shoes and civilian drones, which can be used for both military and non-military purposes, has been heavily criticized in Russia. It spreads fear that the already undersupplied Mobix will suffer even more without volunteer-provided supplies. This decision and the decree of the Russian Federal Security Service prohibiting analysis and prediction of the situation on the battlefield 
Spreading of information about lack of supplies, corruption and lawlessness in the army, basically any criticism of the Russian military campaign and the Russian army, which has been in force since December 1st, demonstrates that the Kremlin intends to curb the enthusiasm of the pro-war volunteer groups, Russian telegram channels, who have been increasingly critical of the conduct of the war. A claim of Ukrainian intelligence that the Kremlin intends to create another private military company, along with the Wagner Group, may be interpreted in a similar way. Putin is wary of criticism, and these moves may indicate that the Russian government is planning to pressure any independent actors, which may have emerged as a result of the war in Ukraine, back to follow the party line. At this point, it looks like the Russian strategy with regard to the war in Ukraine is based on two main pillars. The first is mobilization, which is already making a difference in terms of solidifying the Russian lines and making Ukrainian advances more costly. The second is the destruction of critical civilian infrastructure of Ukraine, with the aim to break the resolve of the Ukrainian people to fight. In the second half of November, Russia continued targeting Ukrainian energy infrastructure, along with other civilian objects. Major airstrikes and cruise missile attacks took place on November 17th and 23rd, According to the Ukrainian general staff, on November 17th, Russia targeted Dnipropetrovsk, Odessa, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia and Mykolaiv oblasts with five airstrikes and 25 cruise missile strikes. Along with the Ukrainian energy grid, this time Ukrainian gas infrastructure, namely the Yushmash enterprise in Dnipro, was targeted as well. On November 23rd, Russia targeted thermal power plants and residential areas in Kyiv, Lviv, Zaporizhia, Ivano-Frankivsk, Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kherson, Chikesi, Dnipropetrovsk, Sumy, Poltava, Kivorohrad, Kharkiv and Vinitsia oblasts with 70 cruise missiles and 5 drones, which again caused blackouts and disruption of energy, heating and water provision. Moreover, part of Moldova lost electricity due to Russian strikes on Ukraine. Statements of Ukrainian officials on the consequences of these strikes were very gloomy. Ukrainian Prime Minister Shmihal stated that almost half of the Ukrainian power grid is out of service due to Russian strikes. The CEO of the Ukrainian energy supplier Yasno, Serhii Kovalenko, said that power outages will likely continue until at least the end of March 2023. Numerous Ukrainian officials have called on Ukrainian civilians to temporarily relocate abroad if possible to ease the pressure on the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. Since Russia has started targeting Ukrainian energy infrastructure, power outages have been very regular, as Ukrainian civilians have to cope without electricity, sometimes for several days in a row. Although the common message of the Ukrainian people in the face of this energy crisis in their country has been of defiance and patience, in rare cases it has caused anger as well. For instance, on November 18th, Dozens of residents of Odessa blocked the road, protesting against the blackout, which lasted for three days in a row. It's possible to argue that this protest was not against energy-saving policies of the Ukrainian government, which stipulate at least several hours of energy supply to residential areas every day, but against the mismanagement of local officials in charge of energy rationing. Nevertheless, the anger and fatigue of the Ukrainian people are exactly what Russia is targeting with these strikes and it is worth monitoring if such incidents become more common. Another piece of bad news for Ukraine is that earlier reports of the depletion of Russian missile supplies and strike capabilities have probably been exaggerated. According to the New York Times, Russia is still capable of producing precision missiles since they have stocked significant reserves of microchips and other technologies necessary for manufacturing precision missiles prior to the war. The Ukrainian Defense Minister Reznikov claimed that Russia has produced 120 caliber and KH-101 missiles and 360 KH-35 missiles since the start of the war. Furthermore, on November 19th, the Washington Post reported that Russia and Iran reached an agreement on the production of Iranian drones in Russia, which is also going to help Russia offset its significant use of cruise missiles against Ukraine. It's worth noting that in this period, Iranian drones were not used as much in Russian attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure as in previous months, which may indicate that as of late November, Russia did not have too many Iranian drones left in its reserves. An interesting wrinkle in the aforementioned Russian missile strikes is that apparently Russia has been using KH-55 cruise missiles, which usually carry nuclear warheads. 
the British Defense Ministry stated that Russia is using its aging Kh-55 missiles without nuclear warheads as decoys to confuse Ukrainian air defenses. Another proposed explanation is that Russia is using conventional warheads with additional ballast on Kh-55s to ensure that the trajectory of these missiles is accurate. This may indicate that Russia has somewhat depleted its arsenal of conventional cruise missiles, which as we mentioned above, may just be an exaggeration. Russia will likely continue putting pressure on critical civilian infrastructure in Ukraine in the foreseeable future. Ukraine also targeted the Russian energy infrastructure in the Kursk Oblast on November 29th. In this period, Western allies continued supplying Ukraine with weapons and financial support. On November 16th, the Biden administration asked Congress for $37.6 billion of additional funding for Ukraine. On November 18th, Finland delivered $56 million worth of military support to Ukraine. Also on the same day, Czechia declared a program for the training of an additional 4,000 Ukrainian soldiers, while it was also reported that Germany is planning to build a maintenance center for Ukrainian military equipment in Slovakia, against the background of information on several Panzerhabitzer 2000 howitzers being in need of repairs. Later in the month, the New York Times claimed that the United States has created a similar maintenance center for Ukrainian howitzers in Poland. On November 19th, Britain pledged 120 anti-aircraft guns and anti-drone equipment. On November 20th, the French Defense Minister announced that France has delivered two Kratal surface-to-air missile systems to Ukraine. On November 21st, it was reported that Luxembourg pledged an unspecified number of HMMWV vehicles, while Turkey supplied Ukraine with the TRLG-230 MLRS, shooting high-precision missiles with a range of 70 kilometers. On the same day, it was announced that Britain provided Brimstone-2 missiles to Ukraine. Two days later, the British Defense Minister Ben Wallace announced that 10,000 artillery shells and three Westland Sea King WS-61 helicopters will be delivered to Ukraine. The supply of British helicopters is an important landmark in the weapon support to Ukraine, as the Sea King became the first manned Western-made aircraft granted to Ukraine. Also on November 23rd, the United States declared its 26th military aid package to Ukraine since August of 2021. It includes additional ammunition for HIMARS and NASAMS, 150 heavy anti-drone machine guns, artillery and mortar shells, harm missiles, 150 HMMWV vehicles, more than 200 generators, and other supplies. Other notable supplies provided or pledged to Ukraine in this month were ammunition for Mars 2 MLRS provided by Germany, one M109 howitzer and 55,000 winter uniforms provided by Norway, 10 marine drones provided by Belgium, and so on. On November 26th, in his interview to Le Parisien, the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba announced that Ukraine is getting weapon supplies from more countries which deny this. So whichever list of military supplies we inform you about may not be full. On November 29th, during the meeting of NATO foreign ministers in Bucharest, statements of unwavering support for Ukraine were made. This included several concrete pledges in support of Ukraine, such as a general commitment to help Ukraine with repairing its energy facilities and protection of its population from missile attacks, Norway's commitment to allocate 2 billion Norwegian kroner for the gas supply of Ukraine, and Sweden's commitment to provide a military aid package worth 270 million euros, consisting of air defense systems, ammunition, winter equipment, and so on. Moreover, NATO's Secretary General Stoltenberg informed about discussions within NATO to provide Patriot air defense systems to Ukraine. While Bloomberg reported about talks within the alliance considering provision of MiG-29 and F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. The Swedish government is also discussing potentially providing Saab Jazz 39 Gripen fighter jets to Ukraine. Also, on November 29th, Slovakia pledged to give 30 BMP-1 infantry fighting vehicles to Ukraine, while the Ukrainian Defense Minister Reznikov informed about the arrival of LRU LMRS, which is the French equivalent of the M270. Another rumored but unconfirmed report was made by Reuters, which informed about discussions to provide GLSDB cheap high-precision munitions with a 160-kilometer range to Ukraine. According to Reuters, this proposal was made by Boeing, and the US government is currently reviewing it.
it is possible to detect the current trend of Western support for Ukraine. The West is trying to help Ukraine with repairing its out-of-order equipment. It is supplying winter uniforms and equipment. It is providing more MLRS. It is discussing ways of giving more advanced air defense systems, like Patriot and fighter jets, which may play a huge role in strengthening the Ukrainian army. The West also intends to continue providing financial support, which is critical for the survival of Ukraine as a state capable of providing services for its citizens. On November 24th, the European Parliament approved an 18 billion euro loan for Ukraine. Along with that, according to Nikkei Asia, the Turkish electric energy company, Car Powership, is negotiating with Ukraine to supply it with power generating ships, which will help offset energy shortages. Let us now look at some of the most notable developments on the diplomatic front. According to Bloomberg, on December 1st, Turkey will close the straits for any vessels carrying oil which do not have insurance. Under the current sanctions regime, it is almost impossible for Russian vessels carrying oil to get insurance. From December 5th, only tankers carrying oil with a cost under the price cap, which the EU is planning to impose, will be allowed to enter the Dardanelles. This effectively means that Turkey is also joining sanctions on Russian oil. Despite being a NATO member and openly supporting Ukraine, so far Turkey has not joined the sanctions regime against Russia and has positioned itself as the most realistic mediator in future talks between Ukraine and Russia. Relations with Turkey and other powerful global and regional players are important for Russia since it gives the sense that Russia is not fully isolated. The above-mentioned report is an indicator that Turkey, which has been less hostile towards Russia so far, is now planning to join the sanctions regime. Even China, which Putin hoped was going to side with Russia, has also partially stopped purchasing Russian oil in anticipation of the adoption of the price cap, according to Bloomberg. Also, despite the initial decision to quit the grain deal following the attack on the Russian Black Sea Fleet in late October, on November 19th, Russia agreed to the extension of the grain deal for a further 120 days. Neither side has made any major territorial gains in the second half of November. Ukraine has met fierce Russian resistance and has stalled in North Luhansk since October. Russia has been making very slow progress in Donbass while taking too many losses. The war is taking a huge toll on both sides. In the previous video, we reported that Chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, suggested that both sides have lost 100,000 men killed and injured. The President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, made a similar claim on November 30th, stating that Ukraine has lost 100,000 men killed and injured. According to the Forbes investigation, Russia has already spent a whopping $82 billion on the war in Ukraine, which is a quarter of its entire 2021 budget. According to the investigation, maintaining 300,000 mobilized costs the Russian budget $1.8 billion per month. But nothing indicates that Vladimir Putin intends to stop this profoundly unjust war of aggression and destruction. Finally, let's look at the visually confirmed losses of military equipment on both sides, confirmed by the Oryx blog as of November 30th. For Russia, 1,523 tanks, 3,250 vehicles, 198 command posts and communication stations, 25 heavy mortars, 520 artillery pieces and vehicles, 159 multiple rocket launchers, 63 aircraft, 71 helicopters, and 151 drones. For Ukraine, these are 374 tanks, 1,048 vehicles, 7 command posts and communication stations, 174 artillery pieces and vehicles, 32 multiple rocket launchers, 55 aircraft, 23 helicopters, and 53 drones. Our coverage of this conflict will continue soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Recently, we've started releasing weekly Patreon and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.